I think an underlying theme that has been growing in this conference has been the building of coalitions. That is, the development of uh, networks of communication and eventual strengthening of political alliances between and among the different groups that are represented here with uh, the eye to eventually figuring out where our interests lie, where our interests in common lie, and who our common enemy is. As we look at farmer laborism in the past, we can draw on, uh, draw on these experiences and see what are the elements of success and failure that have been involved in the various experiences of farmer and working people coalitions. And perhaps we can apply uh, these lessons to our present situation in terms of developing and maintaining the unity between diverse groups of people. I'll start out by introduce, introducing uh, Millard Gieske, who is a professor of political science at the University of Minnesota at Morris, which is in uh, west central Minnesota, uh, a uh, somewhat rural area for the campus to be located in. Uh, Millard is uh, the author of Minnesota Farmer Laborism, the Third Party Alternative, and generally specializes uh, in Minnesota political history. So at this time, I'll introduce Millard to give us an overview of the history of farmer laborism in Minnesota. Millard Gieske. somewhat briefly about a political movement which was institutionalized to the point of becoming an active political party that survives for approximately 25 years during the period of which it elects three United States senators, two governors, and nine, ten, or eleven congressmen, and which in some respects is still with us today sometimes in form, sometimes in, in substance, uh, in the name of what we in Minnesota call the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, which uh, its critics would contend, of course, does not necessarily carry on the tradition as well as uh, they would like to think of it. And as they recall the old farmer labor uh, movement in Minnesota, and for that matter, in the upper Midwest, perhaps uh, in the western part of the United States as well. Basically, I would like to cover my remarks uh, in along three pathways or, or uh, emphasizing three basic themes, excuse me, three basic themes. And uh, those three themes, first of all, would be the cultural uh, elements or roots or pool that provided the means by which the Farmer Labor Party emerged or the Farmer Labor Movement emerged in Minnesota in 1918 to the time that it was disestablished in name uh, and in, as an institution in 1944. Secondly, I'd like to talk briefly about what Farmer Laborism was and then I think last of all I will simply uh, introduce the subject of what possibly the future is for farmer laborism. Uh, in Minnesota, at least, I don't know how far we can extend beyond that, and probably uh, Tom O'Connell will take up that particular stage of development, which we see now uh, with a new movement called the, well, it's a new old movement called the uh, Minnesota Farmer Labor Association. First of all, the general social reasons why we had developing in Minnesota a very uh, important, I would say, in terms of the 20th century, probably the most interesting phase of, of Minnesota political history and Minnesota political activity uh, uh, under the name of farmer laborism. Why did it emerge? I'm going to ask some questions. I'm not necessarily going to give you, I think, the answers about whether it's going to reemerge or reappear in the 1980s. But these are the things that I think that I've seen 
provide an answer or an understanding about uh, Minnesota farmer laborism, why it emerged as a party, and in fact, why it pushed aside uh, the second party in the state of Minnesota, and in effect came for a period of at least a decade to dominate most of the political changes that took place in Minnesota. Well, first of all, one of the basic reasons which gave, I think, a tremendous thrust to Minnesota farmer laborism and the farmer labor movement in the upper Midwest was the spirit of anti-party feeling that began to emerge in the second decade of the 20th century. And as a political scientist, I would simply point out that this was nothing particularly new that was introduced in 1912 or 14 or 15 or 16 or whatever date that you want to uh, uh, see it uh, evolving, but rather it probably began with what the political scientists like to refer the uh, primary system. So there had been an undermining of party. Then, of course, there was growing industrial and social conflict in Minnesota. Minnesota is one of those somewhat different states in the upper Midwest where we cannot say that it is exclusively agriculture or that it's exclusively or dominated by uh, industrial interests, but it had a variety of uh, economic interests which were in conflict in the second decade. First of all, you had the extractive industry or the mining industry dominated by the large steel firms and the emergent labor union movements, the attempts to organize the steel industry or the mining industry in Minnesota unsuccessfully as it turns out. But in fact, there were group or class or economic struggles of a very significant dimension taking place. We can only mention them I would simply say to you that there were two very important strikes in Minnesota that dealt with iron mining in 1907 and 1916. There was violence involved. The mining companies successfully put down the unionization movement. But in fact, it helped create the climate of political and economic and social protest that the farmer labor movement was to build upon. Secondly, in Minnesota and elsewhere, there was growing rural dissatisfaction. And I think we've had this catalog sufficiently enough so that I don't believe that I need to reinforce that other than simply to mention it. But there certainly was a social basis, a cultural basis for uh, being upset. And if you understand that what happens in the cities does not happen in the countryside in Minnesota and really throughout the United States until the late 1930s. That is to say, the cities are electrified, the countryside is not. And living in an, in an uh, agricultural society in those periods is much, much different from what most of you and what most of the speakers today and yesterday and the day before yesterday were talking about the f plight of farmers. It was much different. Can you imagine living in a society which doesn't have electricity? You know, We're blinded by these things here. Well, uh, in, in, a, in a, any event, there was a social difference about being a farmer uh, that marked farming quite differently from living in city, whether one was a worker or whatever. Last of all, there was in Minnesota a very strong, rooted tradition of political, social, and economic protest. That protest we saw in the 1860s and 1870s with the growth of the Grange movement. I don't know how many of you realize, but in Minnesota, the Grange is, was actually founded. The, uh, so that we had the Grange protest and the Grange Granger laws of the 1870s. Uh, 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 then we had the Farmers Alliance of movement in the 1880s. In the 1890s, we had the populist movement. And at the turn of the century in 1900, we had the progressive movement. And these were all feeding into what came to be the farm protest of the 19 teens and 20s or if you will, the farmer labor protest of the 1920s and 30s 
and early 1940s. Last of all, what gave, I think, the final impetus to the growth of Minnesota farmer laborism is another problem or uh, dimension of social activity or disruption that we've had people talk about previously, namely war. Uh, the War of 1917-18 polarized a lot of Minnesotans, and in particular, it polarized a population that had large segments of German-Americans, and particularly German-American farmers and Scandinavian farmers. And without going into the causes of World War I, one simply can say in summation that German-American farmers and Scandinavian farmers in Minnesota were not enthusiastic, many of them, about bailing out the English in their dispute with the Germans. And you can expand that in all kinds of directions, whether you want to talk about imperialism or whatever, but the fact remains that this turned off a lot of Minnesotans so that when you put together the tradition or the culture of protest and the economic and social changes that were taking place, in effect you had a political and social and economic environment which was ripe for a political change or the evolution of a new or a third party movement. Now, specifically, if we can go beyond these general cultural things that were taking place, one should look beyond this and see what else was uh, occurring. First of all, out of North Dakota we had, as previous speakers have talked about, the growth and the development of what was called the Nonpartisan League. The Nonpartisan League was an organization, a political action organization, in large measure designed by people who were social democrats, that is to say socialists, which spread from North Dakota in 1915 and 16 into Minnesota of 1916 and 17, and which had as a program a very broad attempt to help farmers adjust a period of at least met what many people thought was overproduction, too low prices, poor return on their investments, and so forth. So, Institutionally, we had in Minnesota then a new political organization, the Nonpartisan League. Secondly, we had the development of an organization which old timers like uh, Fred Stover and people who will recognize it, what was called the Equity Cooperative Exchange. And the Equity Cooperative Exchange, in sum, served as the forerunner or the pilot of what came to be called in Minnesota. And throughout the upper Midwest, the Grain Terminal Association, or GTA, and the Central Exchange, or Senex, as you see it today. Now, there, there are some interruptions that take place in terms of the continuity of this social and economic movement among farmers. But nonetheless, it was in place. It was a farmer's movement. It was a farmer's movement that attempted to deal with the realities of the marketplace through a farmer's exchange and through the cooperative movement. Then we had in the late 1920s the unionization movement and some very significant events, one of which I just mentioned previously, the iron miners strike. We had in the Twin Cities the development of what was called the street railway strike during 1917-18, something which again polarized the political and social differences between management and labor. And it was in that context the development of the union movement in Minneapolis and St. Paul and on the Iron Range that in effect started to set the stage for this emerging political movement, which I think is broader than just simply calling it a party, it was simply the farmer labor movement. At least that's what I like to pre uh, prefer to have it mentioned. And last of all, I think what gave the final impetus to the emergence of farmer laborism in Minnesota was the Russian Revolution of 1917. Because in Minnesota and the Twin Cities especially and in Minneapolis in particular, but certainly not limited to that area, 
we had a relatively strong socialist movement and the socialist movement felt that now was finally the time in which those people who were being exploited socially, economically, politically, where they would in fact rally and come to their senses and make the kind of political changes and work through new organizations which would ultimately displace the old two-party system. Now, what happens then about 1918 is this. The Democratic Party, and some of you may see some parallels today, but the Democratic Party in Minnesota, in effect, closed its eyes to these social and political developments and instead decided to become a Me Too version of the Minnesota Republican Party. And in effect, most of the organized leaders of the Democratic Party in 1918 in Minnesota endorsed or backed or worked for openly, sometimes silently, members or candidates of the Republican Party. And as a result, there was a political vacuum, and it was into this political vacuum that Minnesota farmer laborism emerged. Now, what you find happening then in the 1920s is not a unified worker and farmer movement, but rather two often separate, often independent, and sometimes disagreeing political and economic movements, both driven to seek a common partnership in an effort to change social and public policy in Minnesota and beyond Minnesota in, upper, in the upper Midwest and perhaps nationally. So that's the genesis of the Minnesota Farmer Labor Movement or Farmer Labor Party. All right, what was Minnesota Farmer Laborism then once it's created? This is the second general theme that I find perhaps one of the more difficult to project to you because Minnesota Farmer Laborism was not one single thing. And it is, in fact, true that the workers and the farmers did not always agree upon what they wanted to do. And within any party organization, for those of you who are students of political parties, you always know that there are going to be groups or factions that, in fact, struggle for power and for domination. And I guess I would have to say that overall, as the Minnesota farmer labor movement was uh, created, and launched, it probably was true that more often than not, the farmer wing of that particular movement was the more dominant wing of the movement. And I think that's probably reflective of the fact that in, if you want to look at demographic changes in 1916, the largest part, well, let's, let's put it this way, the, the farm population in Minnesota, in fact, reaches its peak in 1916. And farmers, in fact, had more votes they were better organized. They were, I think, more accustomed to working in political campaigns. And as a result, they tended, in fact, to dominate this new political movement. Well, what kind of a movement, then, was it to be? Was it to be a workers' movement? Was it to be a farmers' movement? Was it to be a socialist movement? Was it to have as its goal or objective an ever normal granary? Was it to champion McNary Hauganism? Was it to champion the rights of labor to organize and bargain and strike? Just simply, what was it? Excuse me. Well, the fact of the matter is it was all of these things. Because, in fact, for it to succeed, it had to broaden its base and with the demise of the Democratic Party in Minnesota, it drew in some Democrats, some Social Democrats. It drew in some progressive Republicans. It had probably as its ideological leaders, people who kept a foot in both camps, so to speak, because Minnesota farmer laborism had many people in the Socialist Party and in the 1930s, many of those individuals retained dual membership, one in the Socialist Party and secondly, in the farmer labor movement. Then thirdly, 
another basic problem of what its program was is that you got a develop you, you developed a conflict between those who were de uh, who were attempting to design a movement to deal with social problems and literally people who were elected to public office who were concerned with being traditional Republicans and Democrats most of whom often are concerned with re-election rather than necessarily addressing social problems or economic problems or what have you. And so it was the Minnesota farmer labor movement malingered in the 1920s and got a second breath of air of life in the 1930s. It started out cautiously as the depression widened and deepened and as you got unemployment that reached the point of say in say Minnesota between 20 and 25 percent unemployed among the working force as you had more and more farm foreclosures then you had a push or movement to move the Minnesota Farmer Labor Party to the political left. Now you would think that this would have been a natural situation for that party to undertake. In fact it was a difficult one because you were having to move not just simply farmer laborites, but a few Democrats and a few Republicans who had aligned themselves with the farmer labor party. Now, where did it want to go? What did it want to do? And I think this poses a very difficult and basic question for any protest movement and any third party movement. You can retain ideological purity or you can operate as a politically expedient group seeking a role in a plebiscary democracy. And farmer laborites then split very badly. So the result being that over the years, while you had a whole series of very progressive pieces of legislation passed, say, in Minnesota, such as the income tax, as the mortgage moratorium, nonetheless, you had some farmer laborites who were very uneasy about the what they would call the collectivist or the socialist tendencies of that party and you periodically got a very very severe split in that political party you had the first really bad split in 1934 when the party advocated what was a very very socialist program collective ownership you had political leaders who were uneasy, at least some of them were uneasy with this. You had the unity in 1936 when the Democrats endorsed the farmer laborites. You had a falling out in 1937 and 1938 when again the party fell upon evil times internally. As I guess quite frankly you would say, the communist problem as the people in those days would call it namely the Popular Front or the United Front and differences of opinion among farmer laborites just exactly with whom they should cooperate, what should be their attitude towards uh, Nazism. And to sum up, at the close of the 1930s and without repeating so many of the things that we heard said very expertly this morning and yesterday about farm programs. The Minnesota Farmer Labor Party became split over, over foreign policy. A very large part of the farmer labor movement was isolationist, didn't want to be involved in European fights, European intervention. And this was true whether they were from the middle, whether they were from the moderate ring, wing, or whether they were from the left wing. 1938 was a time of political retreat. Protests did not do well in 1938. I think, uh, Fred, you recall the setbacks that took place in 1938. It wasn't just Minnesota, but it was Wisconsin and the entire Midwest. And this effectively undermined the third party movement and the protest movement. By the late 1930s and early 1940s, the Democratic Party had hit upon another strategy, and that strategy was either to destroy the Farm and Labor Party or to incorporate it in, into itself or to recruit some of its leaders, at least a sufficiently large group of it, so that the Farm and Labor Party would disappear. 
as a vehicle for political protest and political change. If we had more time and if I didn't have to look at the clock, and I'm programmed, by the way, to lecture in the other 45 or 50 minute segments, <laughs> I, and I find it difficult to talk in, in, in shorter terms, I might be able to go into that. But nonetheless, uh, the train of events was, was set, and finally, World War II simply sapped the ability of many leaders of the Farmer Labor Party to further resist independence. And that was true whether they were moderates or whether they were part of the political left. Uh, what happens afterward? Well, the party is merged into the Democratic Farmer Labor Party in 1944. I wish Governor Benson were here today because he could tell you some of the reasons that went into that merger from his own personal recollection and experience. I think some of the old farmer laborites, and I think probably Governor Benson, regret that they merged the Farmer Labor Party into the Democratic Party. But in fact, many of the splits that took place in the new Democratic Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota of the mid and late 1940s were already present in the Farmer Labor Party of the late 1930s. So uh, the changes that were taking place, uh, the dual or split personality of the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party that emerged in 1947 and 1948 were in fact present in the old Farmer Labor movement in the 1930s. What happened to the old farmer labor rights then in Minnesota? And um, what about the new farmer labor rights? What are they doing? Well, uh, if you'll permit me to jump ahead, if we can leave the Wallace campaign of 1947 and 1948 and reemerge or reappear in the campaign of Eugene McCarthy of 1968, we would find that some of the old time farmer laborites reappeared in Minnesota's Democratic Farmer Labor Party in 1968, and they backed the candidacy of Senator Eugene McCarthy over against uh, Hubert Humphrey. Then they stayed active in that political party in the 1970s never particularly happy or satisfied, recruited new and young people who were committed to agricultural reform and alternate political uh, policies. And I would simply say that we now have had a second or a third generation, I think it's the third generation, Tom, of the farmer laborites now who have reappeared, so that we have now in Minnesota as at least a pressure group within the DFL, a new movement called the Farmer Labor Association, which is the same name which uh, occurred previously. Is there a future for it? Well, I will simply say that I think that there is a future, certainly as a conscience of the political left and the political liberals that remain in Minnesota. It has a political future if we have the final coming apart of the energy crisis. And what might that be? And what might be the trigger then that turns people to think about political alter alternatives and on, on a mass basis? I'm not sure. I would simply say this, however, that when the revolution comes in Saudi Arabia, as it's bound to come sometime, and when you cut off 30% of the American oil supply from Saudi Arabia, and Americans are face to face with a new crisis, possibly then the farmer labor protest movement of the past and of the present will have a new and broader role to play. That's all. We'll continue now with our uh, discussion of the farmer labor movement in Minnesota by uh, introducing Tom O'Connell of Minneapolis. Uh, Tom is the co-chairman of the
Minnesota Farmer Labor Association, which uh, Mr. Gieske was just speaking of. Uh, he's also done uh, some research work. He has completed his PhD thesis on the history of farmer, the Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota. So I'll turn it over to Tom now. Well, I'm one of those people that uh, feels like it was unfortunate that the uh, Farmer Labor Party merged with the Democratic Party back in 1944. But it's difficult to uh, second guess history. But I do think it's unfortunate, and more than unfortunate, a tragedy that America, the United States of America, is probably the only um, industrial democracy in the world that does not have, does not provide for its citizens a fundamental choice or even a fundamental discussion in the political realm um, on the basic issues around uh, economic democracy, the ownership and distribution of wealth. Um, the only Western democracy that doesn't provide some questioning in the mainstream of its political life about uh, the capitalist system and capitalist priorities. The farmer labor movement at its heart in the 20s and 30s did that. And it did that perhaps more successfully in Minnesota than any other state. And I think that uh, we all are at a loss uh, because that movement was eventually, or temporarily at least, submerged in the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. I want to start uh, basically by addressing a couple of questions really briefly, and then hopefully we can get into some discussion and uh, questioning. First of all, I want to ask the question and pose some answers to the question about what can we learn about the farmer labor experience in Minnesota? What of that is relevant for our political work today? And secondly, what are the prospects for a rebirth, a reemergence, not only of a farmer labor coalition as such, but a much broader coalition, a much broader movement that can provide us with the kind of political choices that the farmer labor movement provided the citizens of Minnesota in the 20s and 30s. But before doing that, I think it's important when we look at that history to kind of try to put ourselves in that history. Uh, otherwise, it could become a kind of an exercise in uh, abstraction. In 1934, uh, the Cooperative Commonwealth Platform was adopted by the Farmer Labor Party, and it was the most radical statement uh, of the farmer labor movement. And one of the things it said in the preamble was that capitalism had failed. And then it went on to propose what was called, I've got it right here in my button, a cooperative commonwealth. Now, I think a lot of historians, particularly coming from the perspective of uh, traditional Democratic Party liberalism, when they look at the experience of the Farmer Labor Party and that statement, capitalism has failed, and that program, a cooperative commonwealth, kind of tend to look at it as some sort of aberration of history a quirk of history, something that happened because Minnesota had a lot of Finnish people or something like that. But if you were a citizen of Minnesota or indeed a citizen of the United States in 1934, if you were a uh, laborer without a job, if you were a farmer uh, who had your own farm uh, foreclosed and had joined with hundreds of other farmers in direct action, and I know you've been discussing the penny auctions and the farm holiday movement, to do something about it. Uh, if you were a member of the Workers' Alliance, uh, or if you were in a labor union that was struggling to, uh, for the right to organize, that statement, capitalism had failed, would be fairly obvious. It was an accurate description of the social and economic reality that people in Minnesota and across the country were facing. All the farmer labor party was was an attempt to provide a political voice and a political program, an organizational vehicle for people to act on that reality, the failure of capitalism, the need to reconstruct uh, an alternative to it. So if we can put ourselves in that historical framework, I think we can understand the working through of the farmer labor movement, what it was all about. Now I think at heart, and I agree with Miller that the farmer labor movement was a coalition, it was a lot of things. 
And as it got successful, like any political party, um, it became a broader coalition. But at heart, there were four basic differences uh, in concept, as seen by the founders of the farmer labor uh, movement, of the farmer labor party and the Democratic, or for that matter, Republican party today. Four major differences. And I, I want to outline those and then suggest that those are the four basic points that we have to look at when asking ourselves the question, how do we construct a response to the current situation we're in today? I'll just list them and then I'll just talk about them. First of all, the Farmer Labor Party, the Farmer Labor Movement, had a direct and mutually supportive relationship with the social movements of the day. Direct and mutually supportive, not antagonistic. Secondly, it had an ideology a unifying ideology or principle that was anti-monopoly or anti-corporate. For one reason or another, every person or most people at the heart of the movement, not necessarily people that, that came later or necessarily just voted for farmer labor, but the active heart of the movement shared a cr criticism and an opposition to uh, monopoly corporate power as it was manifested in the 20s and 30s. Thirdly, it had a purpose that went beyond the heart, the regular purpose of today's uh, political parties as we know them in America, that went beyond the goals of simple electoral success and career building. Its purpose was defined much broader than that, and I'll get into what that was. And fourthly, it had an organizational form that suited that purpose that was fundamentally different than the organizational form that today's Democratic uh, and uh, Republican parties take. First of all, the direct relationship between the party and social movements. I could give a lot of examples. The Farmer Labor Party itself was born out of an alliance between the Nonpartisan League. Have you talked about the Nonpartisan League here during this yeah. forum? Okay. The Farmers Nonpartisan League in Minnesota and the Workers Nonpartisan League, which was a, a labor organization during that time. And I think third spoke of that alliance was the anti-war feeling uh, in, 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 uh, in Minnesota during that time. So it came out of very active social movements of workers and farmers, of uh, German Americans and others who opposed involvement against the war and who organized in the grassroots level. But I think one of the clearest ways in terms of the purpose of this conference to look at that relationship is to take a look at the relationship between the farm holiday movement in Minnesota and the farmer labor movement. You, I imagine you had at least one session on the farm, farm holiday movement here. Is that right? Okay, so I don't have to describe that. In Minnesota, at the height of the organizing, the farm strike, the move to stop foreclosures, the governor of Minnesota, farmer labor governor, Floyd Olson, unlike the, the governors and the state authorities in most other states, including Iowa, supported, basically, he did a little waffling here and there, but he basically supported and often strongly supported the farmer's right to strike and worked very closely with the leadership of the farm holiday movement when the penny auctions were going on, and declared, in a move that many uh, Republicans charged was unconstitutional, a moratorium on foreclosures of farm in Minnesota. The first state to do that, the only governor to make that declaration. That was later passed by the legislature in which the farmer laborites had a majority in the House of Representatives. So there's a very clear working relationship between the indigenous protest movement of the farm, farm holiday movement and the political response. Farm holiday activists were farmer labor activists. And there was a relationship between farmer labor organizations in the rural areas and farm holiday areas. The areas where the farm holiday movement was the strongest in Minnesota were the areas of the greatest strength politically and electorally of the farmer labor party and farmer labor association. I could talk about the unique relationship between the labor movement the militant defense of labor's right to organize by both Floyd Olson and particularly Elmer Benson. We don't have time for that. That's another example of those. I could talk about the relationship between the Workers' Alliance. 30,000 unemployed workers in Minnesota organized in the unemployed alliances with direct organizational affiliations to the Farmer Labor Party and the Farmer Labor Association. That is a very different situation than we have with either the Democratic or Republican parties. Secondly, an anti-monopoly or anti-corporate ideology. 
This, was, this uh, was pretty broad and ranged from the natural resentment of small town bankers in rural communities to the, uh, the growth and centralization of the banking uh, economy in Minnesota. Uh, the natural resentment of small town businessmen to the growth of chain stores, to a much more inclusive anti-corporate uh, ideology of the left of the farm movement and, of course, the socialists in both the farm and labor movement. But I think that what's unique about the farm labor movement in Minnesota uh, was the um, getting beyond a kind of narrow interest group mentality. I think at the core you can draw a parallel between the old debate between business unionism on the one hand and social unionism on the other, and that had its parallel in the farm movement as well. Business unionism, and I would say business farm unionism, is the idea that the goal of our organizing is to get more for us. Our single concern is a bigger paycheck, uh, more is better, self-interest for my group, whether it's building and trades workers or hog farmers, is paramount to hell with everybody else. Social unionism, and I would say social farmer unionism, is the idea that we are united fundamentally as a class of people, that we have one common enemy, which is the domination of our economy by corporate interest and the relationship between government and corporate interest. And if we do not hang together, as Ben Franklin said, we shall surely hang separately. Farmer laborism began because there were people in the farm movement, many of them from the old Socialist Party, many of whom worked in the nonpartisan league in North Dakota and came over to Minnesota, and in the labor movement who understood the importance of that alliance, who had a social union as opposed to a self-interest or business union idea about what was necessary to gain for everyone uh, economic justice. And that carried over into the program of the Farmer Labor Party. Thirdly, purpose beyond winning elections simply, beyond building a career for individuals a collective or common purpose. The founders of the farmer labor movement, and again I agree the farmer labor movement is broader than just the founders, understood that it was going to take decades to change the dominant ideas as well as the dominant economic relationships in Minnesota and around the country. They had an understanding that people have short memories and that the basic messages about how our system works, the basic definitions of what the problems are, uh, were, were basically being made by those who controlled the media of the day. And if you ever, if you're in Minneapolis or St. Paul, want to read about the, the uh, point of view of the uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, establishment of the day, read the Minneapolis and St. Paul papers. They understood that it was important and fundamental to provide both an educational uh, uh, alternative to what people would normally read in the papers um, and also support. And so it was just as important to raise issues more important than to win. And if in the process of raising issues and educating the public you lost, that was highly preferable to failing to deal with the issues and winning, because in failing to deal with the issues and winning, you did not advance the understanding of farmers and workers in the way that it needed to be advanced. And so, in the old Farmer Labor Association and, platform, uh, and party, the platform was paramount. A few years ago, we ran an election uh, in South Minneapolis, where I live, and uh, we're running a candidate. Uh, it was sort of when we were beginning our new association, and one of the planks in the, his platform was public ownership of Northern States Power, our local uh, municipal utility. And uh, I don't know how many of you have been to DFL uh, ward conventions or district conventions or county conventions, but you know there's usually a lot of voting on platforms. And the other candidate was against that, and uh, he saw this as a test vote. If we could carry the vote on public ownership, it might mean that we had control of the convention, so his people fought it as much as they could. Well, the convention voted two to one to go on record in favor of taking over the electric utility in Minneapolis, and then turned around and voted uh, you know, almost two to one to elect the guy that led the fight against it. In the Democratic Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota, and I think probably in other places, <coughs> the platform is simply the uh, window dressing um, and what's really important is electing candidates and the relationship between the two is minimal, to say the least. 
And so finally, and the fourth point about the Farmer Labor Party was that it developed an organizational form that could carry on its larger purpose, which was more than winning, but which was educating, which was providing people with a sense of power, uh, which was going to provide a year-round organization. That was called the Farmer Labor Association. And this is different than the way the DFL is organized today. There were literally hundreds of clubs uh, in townships, in counties, uh, in wards, in cities across the state. Farmer labor clubs. They would have monthly meetings. They would sing music. They would uh, play cards. They would have someone from the Farmer Labor Education Bureau to come in and talk about uh, the situation in Spain or what social security is all about or what public power is about or how to organize a co-op. They would carry on year-round educational activities. They would adopt a platform, and then the party itself was simply a legal entity to run the campaigns. And the party was subservient to the educational activities and the political thrust of the association. I think that's the way we ought to organize our political parties in this country. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't mad as an applause line. <laughs> so those are four, I think, fundamental differences that the founders and that the real, what I would say the real farmer labor rights had in mind uh, when they organized the Farmer Labor Party. And I think all of them uh, are essential for any revitalized movement uh, in the country today. Let me just address um, the question of where to now. What are the prospects for a renewed uh, reinvigorated not only farmer labor movement or alliance, but uh, anti-corporate movement in general. In 1944, in Minnesota, the Farmer Labor Party uh, did merge with the Democratic Party. And uh, Hubert Humphrey was uh, the Democratic, uh, one of the leaders, uh, certainly came to symbolize uh, the Democratic side of the DFL party. Uh, in 1948, uh, the struggle between the farmer laborites and Democrats was pretty much concluded with the victory for the Hubert Humphrey Democrats. What that victory really meant, in a sense, uh, was, was, was a victory of, uh, well, let's see, how can I put this? I guess Hubert Humphrey really represented, in a sense, the idea uh, that the fundamental interests of the average uh, working person were in harmony with the interests of an expanding corporate America. Whereas what the old farmer laborite at its core represented was that there was a contradiction or conflict between the interest of corporate power and the interests of workers and farmers. So that the Democratic Farmer Labor Party triumphant under Hubert Humphrey basically was a party where a social contract between a big labor uh, between uh, government, between uh, a corporate class, an accommodation was reached. Um, price was paid, particularly by third world countries, but an accommodation was reached that an expanding capitalist economy could accommodate um, that kind of political coalition. I believe that fundamental accommodation is coming to an end. It's unraveling. And Hubert Humphrey liberalism um, is at a crisis point. Um, I think we can look at the presidential elections and see that that's a fact. And so I think that fundamentally the conditions for that kind of triumph are no longer with us. And I think that's an important fact in any discussion of what are the prospects for renewed farmer labor type movement in the 80s. Now what we're trying to do in Minnesota is start small and begin the process of re-knitting that coalition and that understanding, not only among farmers and urban people, uh, but among labor and neighborhood groups, among women, minorities, among all the various groups that have been pretty much splintered into, again, a business unionism, self-interest approach uh, to politics, an interest group approach to politics. The first uh, seeds, particularly of urban-rural cooperation, came with a, a very uh, strong, uh, militant uh, revolt 
against the uh, routing of a power line across central Minnesota, vintage farmer labor country, and the direct action protest of farmers against that line, ironically put up by an old electric co-op started in the, the days of the farmer labor movement, which had pretty much <laughs> gone sour and adopted corporate ideas about energy. The power line protests put together people from the anti-war days in Minnesota, in the rural areas of Minneapolis, or the, in Minneapolis, with farmers, and there was an exchange. People that had learned the principles of nonviolent protest, protesting the war in Vietnam, had learned the principles of cooperation, setting up an urban consumer co-op movement, long-haired people working with farmers of traditional uh, quote-unquote values in a very creative, very potent and powerful protest movement. And the seeds of that are with us. Our first farmer labor candidate for governor, the woman that, that serves with me as a co-chair of the organization, is Alice Tripp, a farmer, a leader of that movement, who campaigned against incumbent DFL or Rudy Perpich, ran around the state in a solar, in, in a gasohol powered pickup truck with a solar powered uh, amp system, uh, and talked about um, issues of concern to both farmers and workers. Um, and I think, and got 100,000 votes, 20% of the vote, spent $4,000 getting those 100,000 votes. We uh, paid less per vote than any candidate in Minnesota history. <laughs> Another example of farmer labor, rural urban cooperation. The cooperation between the uh, American agriculture movement in Minnesota, just beginning and urban people in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Two years ago, the Farmer Labor Association, which really got to start in Minneapolis, it's in its latest rebirth, introduced resolutions throughout the then Democratic Farmer Labor caucuses on the issue of farm parity. A lot of us had trouble explaining to our urban neighbors what farm parity was, but it passed uh, the 5th District, which is Minneapolis, passed the 4th District, which is St. Paul. It did better in some urban areas than it did in some rural areas. Now this is a small, simple example of cooperation. And given what I said about the value of resolutions in the Democratic Farmer Labor Party and platform statements, perhaps of only marginal political value, but it was a beginning and I think began again to knit the kind of cooperation and trust between farmer and labor groups. And now we have a farmer labor chapter in the heart of American egg territory, the west central area of Minnesota, right around Appleton and where Elmer Benson Yells from, and I see Ann Canton is here, who's a member of the association. I was happy to see that when the grain millers went on strike in the port city of Duluth, it was members of the American egg movement who stood up as farmers and said, We support the right of workers to strike, and we support your situation. And it was the American egg movement, some of whom were members of the Farmer Labor Association, who sent food shipments to support the striking coal workers two years ago when that conflict was going on and our president was invoking, threatening to invoke the Taft-Hartley injunction. These are some of the seeds of farmer labor cooperation. I want to leave you just with a couple thoughts and then we can move on. As I look at the history of the farmer labor movement in the 20s and 30s and before that the populist movements, the IWW and Wobblies uh, and the labor movement, I am struck by one incredible thing. And that is the tremendous passion for education and democracy that working people and farmers had. <coughs> the Farmer Labor Party had a, had a newspaper that went out every week called the Minnesota Leader. And its quality and its seriousness uh, is not matched in my mind by any, uh, any newspaper, uh, any movement newspaper that I've seen today. A very, uh, very comprehensive treatment of the major issues facing people. And people read it. Thousands and thousands of people read it and discussed it. Somehow people had the sense that it made a difference to read, that it made a difference to understand, and that that cliche economic democracy or controlling our society was something that people understood. The question is today, with even greater centralization of media, with even more of a mass culture, with even greater sense of despair and hopelessness, what are the tools and what are the ways that we can revive that sense that people socially 
can exercise control over the shape and direction of economic decision making? How can we extend the principles of political democracy to include the fundamental economic decisions that we have to make? I believe we can, but I think we have to think that one through. We have to understand the changes that our culture has gone through, and we have to insist that education, that reading, that understanding is central to building a revitalized democratic spirit. And that, beyond any specific about programs that we could talk about, uh, is the fundamental task I think that we have, and it's one I think we'll be able to achieve. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, a dairy farmer from Minnesota by the name of Roy Peterson. Uh, Roy was born on a farm near Beardsley, Minnesota in 1902. Uh, at the age of 21, he moved to Swiss County, Minnesota and started milking cows at that time. Uh, after a long and uh, successful farming career, Roy turned the farm over to his son three years ago. Uh, Roy, uh, in his earlier years, was active both physically and mentally, he says, in the Farmers' Holiday, the Nonpartisan non League, and the Farmer Labor Movement. And he does add that he was not active in the church. <laughs> All right, Roy. This amazes me. Uh, it's true I wasn't very active in the church. Some of my best friends are and are doing a good job. Uh, the third party movement. I thought I was going to talk about the holiday, but I got to talk about the third, day, uh, third party movement. Uh, North Dakota educated Minnesota. The nonpartisan league. We got terrific, uh, a terrific impact from that. And uh, then we followed with the farmer labor leader in Minnesota, which done a good job of educating the people. One thing it taught, uh, we learned that uh, human rights are prior to and above property rights. And I've taught my kids that. I got four boys and uh, None of them I don't think will ever cross a picket line. And I told them we, we might have to go to Afghanistan, and they said, hell no, we won't go, we won't die for Texaco. <laughs> so I'm not worrying about my boy. Uh, we elected some great men in Minnesota. Elmer Benson, perhaps the greatest governor any state ever had. And I say that without any qualifications. Elmer says it's, it'd be nice to always be right, but he says it's better to be honest. And Elmer was honest, and he is honest. It's a shame that he can't be here today, but you gotta admire the grit. The man went down to that American Ag office every day when he couldn't walk, he fell down a lot of times. And one day he fell down at home, and I don't know if he'll ever walk again. And his wife, Frances, is doing a terrific job taking care of him. But if you heard that tape the other night, boy, that's Peppy, and that's Elmer. Anybody says he didn't have the qualifications of a, of a governor, don't know Elmer Benson. Uh, in a little book review here of Milton's book, and I want this to be personal, but uh, it's mentioned that he didn't have humor. I don't know, did you interview Elmer? Sure. I wish you could have spent as much time with him as Jim Shields did. So you could have known him just a little better. To know Elmer is to love him. He has humor. <laughs> Probably when he was dealing with Dick Lilly, who was a payoff man for U.S. Steel, the man who only propositioned him to uh, 
He told me, uh, unless you change your tactics, one of the big churchmen in Minnesota would turn his church against him. And Elmer suggested that churchman go to a place to which he tried to keep everybody else out of. Maybe that wasn't tact. Maybe, maybe it wasn't diplomatic. But I think they got the message. Dick Lilly tried one other time. Elmer told me this. I've known Elmer since 1929, and better the last 10 years, because I've had a little time. The last couple of years, I'd go over to the American Ag Office over in Appleton, and we'd go in the back room, and boy, did I ever get an education. I wish my boy could have gotten it. But uh, when he was elected to governor, they told him he had to come to a banquet, one of the top men said, they want to have a banquet for you. He said, I don't want a banquet. He says, I don't like banquets. He said, just tell them to forget it. Finally, he come to him and he says, you got to have a banquet. So they had the banquet. I guess it was in the Radisson, I think it was in the Radisson Hotel. It was immaterial. And uh, they told him where to sit and everything. And he had never met Dick Lilly before, but Dick Lilly was sitting inside him, and he <laughs> told him who he was. He says, how big a family you got, Elmer? I got two children. He says, one boy and one girl. What do you plan for them for the future? Well, he says, I want them to have a good education and have an opportunity to get a decent start in life. Dick Lilly says, that's wonderful. He says, we can, we can arrange a fund for that. We can do that. And Elmer says, what? He says, we've done it for other people. Why not for you? And Elmer says, I started to talk to the other guy, and I didn't, uh, I didn't talk to Dick Lilly anymore. Dick Lilly died a, few day, a couple of years ago. Payoff man for U.S. Steel. Now, uh, in a review of this book, Uh, it was said he was dispassionate, like the right-wing membership of the Farm Labor Party, such as Jelmer Peterson. Jelmer Peterson was a stubborn Dane. I'm one, too. And Shipstead. We had a congressman, Francis Schuma. 